itself important because much of the development problems are common. If one takes for the example of, of lighting, off-grid lighting, 80 million households in India don't have access to lighting. 20 million if one adds South Asia, 100 million. Sub-Saharan Africa, 100 million. Problems similar, how can we identify solutions and transfer them in a effective manner so that we're not reinventing the wheel. If one looks at healthcare, I can think of innumerable inventions around healthcare and measurements and et cetera, but can we not see how one continent can learn from the other, one country can learn from the other, and even in India, I would say, how one state can learn from the other. To start off, I'd like to invite Shubhadeep, uh, who represents Greenlight Planet, because this is about social entrepreneurs. They are the ones at the center. These are the ones that we have to assist in replicating to talk about his experience. Uh, from the IFC World Bank Group, South-South is a very key pillar of our involvement as a knowledge and a solutions bank. With 182 country membership, 65 offices, our main job is to identify good practices, nurture them and transfer them across. And the leadership learning and inclusive business group that I'm part of in the World Bank's job is to incubate and then transfer these solutions externally or internally within the World Bank. We need to do this in a cost-effective manner, in a systematic manner. So towards this, as you may have heard this morning, we work with IntelliC app to develop a South-South replication framework. And I'd like to talk about this, that if we had this framework earlier, would he have found this useful? So what do you need to do to replicate? And the next question is what we can do as development agencies and institutions to support this. So without further ado, Suvudhi, talk about <laughs> your experiences. What have you been doing? What are your learnings? And, and what were the challenges? Thanks. Thanks, Anil. Um, I'd like to start by um, highlighting this entire opportunity. So, you know, there was, if you spoke to somebody 20 years back, uh, there was one part of the world which was considered the world of opportunity in terms of growth, development, consumption. And then there were a set of nations which were all, always said, okay, there is, there, in the future, there will be an opportunity someday but nobody would quantify that opportunity. Now today that opportunity is quantified uh, and the numbers are staggering. Uh, so by 2025, uh, countries in the South will have 600 million people who earn more than $20,000 a year. And that's a consumption opportunity of $4 trillion a year. So now that the opportunity is quantified, uh, the question is what are the kind of sectors that can leverage this opportunity and how do we, how do we go about it? So our story is, uh, is quite interesting. So um, the company was founded by three engineering college students in Chicago uh, who identified this opportunity in India. Um, they started selling manufacturing, selling and marketing solar lamps in India. And soon uh, they realized that, okay, there is India, which has 80 million households, as Anil said, uh, who don't have access to electricity. So 80 million households roughly translates into 400 million people only in India. And then they looked towards Africa saying, okay, uh, we, we know that there are issues in Africa as well. And then we realized that there are about 100 million households in Africa who don't have access to electricity, which is another 500 to 600 million people. So the, the challenge was uh, how do we translate our learnings and how do we leverage this opportunity by using the best practices that we've, uh, we've learned in India. Uh, so uh, we, we couldn't do it on our own. Uh, we had uh, the help of uh, organizations like the IFC, uh, who would introduce us to the right partners, uh, help us navigate the regulatory environments. Uh, but what really helped us was um, to localize wherever we went. So it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, approach. Uh, so we learned some things in India. When we went to Kenya, we did things differently. When we went to Ethiopia, we did things differently. And now we have a footprint across uh, 20 countries uh, in Africa. And globally, we are present across 35 countries. But I think the fundamental the fundamentals still remain the same. Uh, awareness, accessibility, and affordability. You would have heard it uh, yesterday as well. So uh, awareness is something which we, 
you know, awareness is a classic example of cooperation. So organizations like Lighting Asia, Lighting Africa, help in creating awareness of the category. <coughs> After that, we take care of the availability and affordability parts. Uh, so it's a, it's a good example of how various organizations uh, work together. Uh, what we have done is we've built a network of uh, 6,000 village level entrepreneurs uh, in India over the last five years who've earned about $7 million in personal income, and that's a huge, huge amount of money. And now we've replicated the same model across Kenya and Uganda, and soon uh, we'll do that across uh, different countries in Africa. So that was just a brief uh, you know, description of what we do and how we've gone about uh, this entire cooperation model. Uh, I can keep talking on, but happy to take other questions. Thanks, Obadi. We'll come back to you. I'd li like to go to Mr. Manpreet Anand and uh, the Honorable Ambassador, Mr. Richard Verma, gave examples of where you've actually done this. But why do you think Manpreet's South South is important for USAID, and what are the kind of instruments and, uh, and support systems that you're putting in place? Well, thanks, Anil, and, and thanks uh, to, to Suncorp for organizing, I think, this really important topic about <laughs> how to promote South South uh, cooperation. Um, if I may, I maybe could take just a couple of minutes to talk about USAID's approach uh, to this, uh, which has actually changed dramatically over the last few years. Um, we are taking a very multifaceted approach. Uh, we operate in over 100 countries, including 32 in Asia. And the mission of USAID is to partner to end extreme poverty and promote resilient democratic societies. It's that first word, or for second word, I guess, in that mission statement around partner that is so critical. And it's not by accident that we put that right at the outset of our mission statement, because we know we can't do it alone. Um, and that is, I think, the uh, fundamental uh, reason or rationale behind why South-South collaboration is so important, that it takes partnership um, at the grassroots level, at the local government le level, at the um, subnational and national levels to be able to address some of these uh, issues. So as we look at our, our model, our new business model, I should say, it's all about um, trying to harness science and technology, about sponsoring innovation, about promoting these new partnerships that will enable us to leapfrog um, the development challenges of today. And South-South cooperation is a big part of that. We've had um, over 50 years of experience in providing technical advice and, and, and experience in foreign assistance to a number of different countries. And so USAID is really well positioned uh, to be able to partner with emerging regional and global powers to, to provide the type of development assistance that is so critical. And so as we increase our engagement with emerging donors, uh, such as India, such as Indonesia, such as Kazakhstan, uh, such as Brazil, um, we look at how we can build in, in the long term, these types of partnerships that are committed to achieving development objectives, uh, look at how we can adapt good practices that we've learned together through our partnerships, and really bring to the table ideas and experiences that might be useful to other developing countries. And so this is really at the forefront of our model as we go forward. If you look at some of the numbers, in 2014 alone, we entered into nine agreements engaging three dozen new partners, leveraging more than $175 million with, with roughly a $30 million contribution from USAID. That's only in India. And this is the kind of partnership mode that we're looking to do across the world. Um, and we've had, uh, we've had some success because USAID is looked to, and the US government more entirely, as a convener, as an accelerator, as an entity that could uh, possibly be an honest broker to identify, to test, to scale, to share innovations that have been proven in one, one geography and have the potential for development impact elsewhere. And so, as we know, as India makes huge strides in economic development, uh, the governments between the US and India are looking forward and have been trying to share technologies and processes and learnings to really fuel that development, not just in India, but across the world. And so we think we can try to do that 
in less time, at lower cost, and with better results. Maybe I can just tease out a couple of examples of how this has manifested itself. Um, and then I really do look forward to the, to the discussion. First, in agriculture. So we have a um, US-India food security triangular activity, triangular training activity, where we're working with the government of India's National Institute for Agricultural Extension Management. And we, are, we have already now successfully trained over 180 professionals from Kenya, from Malawi, from Liberia, in agriculture extension uh, and in marketing. And this is just in the past couple of years. But we've been able to bring together government and private sector partners from across Africa that have come here to India to see how extension services can be delivered, how their markets can be structured, uh, to learn how India has actually gone from a food insecure nation to one that is a, later, a leader sorry, in food production. And so we are trying to see how we can help other countries in Africa and in South Asia learn from India's success. And you know, frankly, it may seem like these are small numbers, but these are important because they're very uh, important in sending signals. Um, in this particular example, you know, we brought over uh, a couple of uh, uh, leaders and, and government and policymakers in the ag space and in the very next round, we had calls from half a dozen ministries across the government of Malawi saying, we want to be a part of this. We understand the value of this. We, we need to be able to import these learnings to our country. So I think there's a lot that we can, we can learn from here. I'll just mention one more example, and then I'll, and then I'll close. And that's one um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the clean energy space. Um, we have established a model uh, through a program <coughs> called W Power, uh, which is to extend the clean energy value chain to the, to the last mile, to rural Indians who don't have access to, to modern energy technologies. And we've been able to create a sustainable network of over a thousand rural women entrepreneurs who deliver affordable solutions to over one million people in Maharashtra and Bihar. And now through this partnership on women's entrepreneurship and clean energy that we're supporting, the same model is being replicated in East Africa and in Nigeria. And the partnership is providing training and business assistance over 7,000 women to launch distribution networks of small enterprises around small scale energy technologies, things like cook stoves and solar lanterns. So this is not just an India specific strategy. This is one that we're looking at replicating across the world. Um, and I think whether it's India, East Africa, Indonesia, uh, what have you, we're even helping the government of Kazakhstan stand up their own donor agency in the, in the name of Kazaid. Um, we're looking at how we can partner with these rising regional and global um, uh, powers to, to really focus in on the development issues that we all care about um, and try to promote them in a way that does promote South-South cooperation. So that's a bit about how we're, we're moving forward. <coughs> no, thank, thanks, thanks, Manpreet. Great to see this new um, strategy and new approach and, and, the, and the partnership approach, which obviously is showing excellent results. I'd like to turn to my colleague on the left, uh, Mr. Karma, who's the CEO of the SARC Development Fund. <laughs> so if the development challenges are common between India and Africa, surely they're much more common within South Asia. The SARC region remains the least integrated region amongst all the economic blocs. The SARC Development Fund uh, has been set up uh, to promote regional integration, but above all, uh, look at social enterprise development and uh, to see what can be done for South-South replication. So I'd like to turn to Mr. Karma to introduce SARC Development Fund and how he thinks that uh, the fund will now roll out the South Asia Enterprise Development Program and his feeling about cross-border South-South application. Uh, thank you, Anil. I represent an institution of, uh, owned by eight countries of South Asia. Therefore, I'm not talking South-South, I'm talking within the South itself. These eight countries, as, as Anil said, uh, we have a lot of commonalities, yet a lot of complexities. It's uh, seemingly very uh, 
so many variables that are common, but also very difficult to, to understand the complexities within the uh, eight countries. Uh, as Anil mentioned, the trade between the SAC countries is less than 5%. Like, unlike any other trade associations, NAFTA, Euro, Mercosur, or even South Africa, where I've been to, they are far more integrated than South Asia is. We, are so, we have so much in common. Maybe this, uh, the commonness has differentiating us, keeping us apart. For, but for some reason, uh, the uh, heads of states of the eight member countries, I, if you know SAC, otherwise I'll just, we start from Afghanistan, Pakistan, and let's walk geography. Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Maldives, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, and, and Bhutan. So we are eight of us uh, together in this geographical uh, contiguous region with different sizes, different complexities, different stages of economic development. And therefore, from an uh, economic perspective, there's not very common within the uh, sizes and the geography and the level of economic development. Precisely for this, the member countries felt that we needed a dedicated institution that would help SAC people work together, South Asians. Apparently, as, as, as Anil said, we don't trade among ourselves for more than 5% of our total exports and imports within the whole, you know, the, and also very difficult, uh, an export to Pakistan from uh, India go, takes about 39 days, goes via Dubai, and a telephone call from Sri Lanka to Kathmandu is much more expensive than from uh, uh, Colombo to Washington, D.C. So there are a lot of issues that we need to resolve, and uh, the SDF, given its humble nature, is not intended to resolve all the issues, but it is intended to bring about a closer regional integration among ourselves through trade and investment. Now, uh, for this, to facilitate this, we have, in our charter, we have designed three windows, three vehicles. One is the social window, which is what, what we are going to discuss today and where we have been working on for a while. Next is economic window, we are talking about agribusinesses and so on and so forth. And third is infrastructure window. Now, of the three windows we have activated, by the way, this institution is four and a half years old. And uh, I am the first CEO starting this institution. And uh, we have been trying to do many things at the same time because you have 10 priority areas, first 10 things to do, one of, is, one of which is to build an institution. So we have been building an institution, at the same time putting in place uh, social programs and putting in place investment, which is infrastructure and economic window, which starts with any investment like Citibank or any other bank uh, would start with, start with credit policy, credit manuals, and business logic. So we are doing all of that. And in the process also, we have uh, put in place now social programs worth about $66 million over a four and a half year period among the, uh, within the eight countries. Some countries have four projects, some countries have three projects, but we have projects on the ground of $66 million and many more on the pipeline. But from last year, we felt that we also needed to address this entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship space. And last year we had um, a program here in Delhi, a brainstorming, and we all of us agreed that we needed to be relevant in the social enterprise space as well. So we have entered that now, and we are being helped, and uh, we are very grateful to the World Bank. We have a team from the World Bank who are helping us think this through because we are replicating World Bank's development marketplace model, and we will take it a little bit further than uh, DMPP. The essence of the uh, social enterprise for us is few. One, obviously we, we are aiming at uh, bottom of the uh, base of the pyramid. Second, we want to be doing cross-border because yesterday I mentioned in one of our panels that uh, SDF Charter requires us to have three countries uh, involved in any project that SDF does. And in my little knowledge, I've been to Europe and elsewhere, there is no single institution that requires three countries. But I think that is unique for us because, precisely because less than 5% integrated, maybe we should be forced into working together. So therefore, SDF cannot do anything without three countries together. So that may be a virtue of the SDF. And the other, other wonderful virtue of SDF is any institution in the South Asia wanting to enter another country on your own may be difficult, but if you came through SDF, you have the blessings and support of eight governments at the same time. So any project that SDF would fund, work with you, will have the eight governments working with us. That means the, the, uh, you, shouldn't be, you shouldn't be facing problems that you would face otherwise as an individual uh, company or uh, institution. So with the World Bank's help, 
This program that we're going to launch, we have called it Social, Entrepre Social Enterprise Development Program. The objectives, number one, is to, is to target the base of the pyramid. Second, and more important, enable the investors, social entrepreneurs in South Asia work together. We would like to take help or partner with the social entre uh, entrepreneur in Pakistan, come to Bangladesh, India, vice versa. So this is something very important for us. And in this, uh, I'll come to it a bit later, the uh, third objective for us is also all of us understand that social enterprises require a lot of hand-holding. And therefore, there are, for instance, in India, the social entrepreneurship has gone way ahead compared to the rest of the South Asians. Therefore, we would like to see the transfer of skills, social skills, financial skills, management of entrepreneurs, enterprises at different levels within the SARC. And if there's not adequate, we have from outside, but the focus is on the, on the SARC. Uh, we would also like to take the, the investors, not only social uh, skills, but investors within the SARC region to work together. We want to be able to network through this platform of SDF. We want to offer a platform to everybody in South Asia or beyond South Asia to work together, create a vibrant entrepreneur enterprise program in the South Asia. Uh, we, uh, the, the way we are designed the program is first we are looking at pure grant, basically skilling up the uh, entrepreneurs across South Asia. Second, we want to be also, because we are a fund, unlike a an, uh, an, uh, pure invest investor, we are a fund, we are a development fund, which uh, d the word development has a huge man remit in our thinking, in our, in our logic. So therefore we also would be funding a uh, second level of uh, funds which is called pure grant. And third, pure grant means just the grant. And second level is renewable grant, which means we give you X amount to help you through your business and then return that money to us at zero interest. And at some point, because we have the investment window, we also want to connect that with the uh, concessional loan. So these are the three programs we were thinking through. We are going to launch it. It's formally been approved by the board, and then uh, we are going through the processes. But there are a lot of challenges. And one of the objectives of my coming here is to listen to the social entrepreneurs and encourage you to work with us and to introduce to you a platform that is available for you to take your uh, entrepreneurship skills outside India, Bangladesh, in the rest of the South countries. So I'll, be, I'll stop here and we'll be happy to uh, answer questions. <coughs> Thanks, Karma. The innovation team of the World Bank is very happy to be a knowledge partner uh, to the SARC Development Fund to promote the social enterprise development program. The issue becomes, how do you get replication south to south? Should it be just ideas that you share? Should it be a company like Greenlight Planets organically going across, in which case, how do you set up these partnerships? Should it be a franchise model? There's an example of Husk Power, which we invested in in, in, in Bihar, which provides off-grid electricity to uh, the villages from 6 to 10 p.m. They went to Africa, we set up a franchise. They've gone through a franchise model. If you go through a franchise model, there are advantages, there are disadvantages. So how do you get the message across and how do you get the replication across is, is, is one issue. And this replication framework gives those options that we've developed that you can think through. Um, so Vidip, if you had that framework before you, before you did this, would you have found it useful? And what is the model that you've adopted and why? And above all, what did you have to change? I mean, your product is clearly a hard product, but the market is, is different. People are different. How did you adopt in terms of the soft aspects to make this business successful? So we, uh, we were in a very unique uh, situation. So we were a startup, and we were a startup in a category which was very nascent. Uh, so we were literally flying a plane and constructing it while flying it. Uh, so to answer your question, if we had a manual, a flying manual before we got onto the plane, it would have really helped. Uh, so we went, we literally went into the unknown um, category penetration, like low single digits. Uh, so the model we tried to adapt was uh, partnerships, uh, looking for like-minded uh, companies, looking for institutions. Uh, and as an example, one of our biggest partners in East Africa is One Acre Fund, who work with, like, on an average every year, they work with about 200,000 farmers, uh, give them farm loans and a whole lot of other stuff, and uh, give our lights uh, as well, sell our lights to them. 
So what we had to do is we had to really identify the right partner in every geography we went to and also navigate a lot of, um, I wouldn't call it bureaucracy, but a lot of regulator, regulators. And um, so w while we were fortunate to have the support of uh, a lot of institutions, uh, but the learning that we have now and whenever uh, fellow startups come to us uh, for advice is what we tell them is that look, uh, don't go in with this framework of that we are entering Africa or we are going to South Asia or SARC for that matter. Because the moment you start, get out of the plane in every country, it's a completely different ball game. And um, your business plan has to, be, uh, has to be tailored for each market individually, for each quarter individually. And I know it sounds a little strange, but uh, there are different crop cycles in different countries, so th there's more money. And I'm talking of rural consumers here. Uh, so there is money uh, in people's hands at different parts of the year. Uh, so one of one of these learnings was a supply chain learning. So we said, okay, we'll import everything into Kenya and then distribute. What we realized is that we had huge excess inventories at certain points in time, uh, because the throughput in, uh, in let's say, Tanzania was at a different time, Ethiopia was at a different time, and so on. So, um, so uh, again, going back to this uh, entire uh, aspect of uh, partnerships. So right partnerships, and uh, the second part is credible partnerships. Uh, because uh, especially for entrepreneurs like us who are relatively small, uh, when you go to the government uh, for let's say something as simple as uh, import duty waiver on solar products, uh, the first thing they look for is credibility. Who are you? Uh, where is your uh, you know quality certification? So for instance, Lighting Africa, Lighting Global runs this quality certification program. So now we can go with them with a certificate from Lighting Global saying, hey, our products are Lighting Global certified. Suddenly that the tone and manner in which the governments look at you, the regulators look at you changes. Uh, uh, so I think, um, so credibility, access, and and uh, really tailor-making uh, partnerships in each geography uh, is important. Um, on, uh, in fact, Karma and I were just talking before coming on the stage about uh, the fact that uh, outside of India, we are not directly present in any country in within SARC. And we're present in 20 plus countries in Africa, and we're present in Central America as well. Uh, so the point is, there is a there's a huge amount of scope, and it's uh, and it's not that we don't want to, because for us it's much easier to go to a uh, let's say a Nepal or a Bangladesh than to uh, Nigeria. Uh, but the point is that I think that environment needs to be created, and I think uh, from what I've heard from Karma is that maybe the time has come for that environment to be created where we can really leverage proximity and uh, do more within the region. If I could just sure. add on to that. Okay, Please. Uh, I mean, I think the last point you made is so critical, right? Because even the examples I described were much more people-to-people -people examples, right? You know, how are we bringing women entrepreneurs? How are we focusing on, you know, agricultural mechanization and other ways to... But having that environment that is conducive to, to more interaction within the region is also critically important. And so that's why, you know, you need the, the high-level policymakers and, frankly, leaders to be able to buy into that vision. Um, and so, you know, when, just as an example, when, when President Obama was here back in uh, 2012, he and the, and, and the leadership here uh, at that time uh, talked about, you know, building on the, 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 um, the, the green revolution times from decades ago but really focusing on, on an evergreen revolution now. How can we build sustainability into the agriculture sector? How can we move together in that sp space? Then fast forward to, to just last year when, um, in the last several months, frankly, when both President Obama and Prime Minister Modi have now met twice in, in the span of a few short months. Part of, part of that interaction also included something that is a really long name but actually really important, which is the U.S. government and, and the government of India have entered into an agreement uh, that defined the guiding principles on triangular cooperation. Now, what does that actually mean? What that means is that we're committing ourselves to working together, to sharing best practices, so that we can address development challenges not just in India, but also in other parts of the world. And it's not just Africa this time. It is about South Asia. It is about Southeast Asia. Uh, it falls in nicely with both, you know, the U.S.'s uh, foreign policy prerogative around the Asia rebalance, but also into uh, the government of India's uh, policy prerogative around Act East or Look East before that. So I think 
creating that type of policy environment that encourages this type of collaboration and interaction is, is also critically important. And that's a role, frankly, that we ought to be taking on uh, as bilateral uh, <coughs> donor agencies. I think that's a, that's a great vision. Katna alluded to the development marketplace. Uh, this is competition that we've been running for social enterprises in the India's low-income states to address some of the problems because that's where uh, the, the poor are in, in, in our country here. Um, one component of that was intrastate replication. Our experiences was that was the most difficult aspect, even within India. Um, so now we're talking intra-country. So there has to be a support system to make that happen. What are the kind of support that's needed to go south-south? One is this replication framework, but you've, we've heard of, of mentoring. We've heard of financing uh, issues coming up. How could we perhaps mitigate that first mover disadvantage that a social enterprise goes through when moving from one border uh, to another border? What could we do to look at policy issues on the other side, uh, look at cross-border financing, which becomes a big issue? It costs five times as much to open an LC between the northeast of India and Bangladesh than between India and the US. Simple thing. You can't, that's why, I mean, one, one reason why informality happens. If I'm an exporter that wants to send material from Tripura to uh, across the border, uh, to, to, to Silhet in Bangladesh, it will cost me five times more to open an LC and with all the processes. That same good would have a different classification in terms of the last digit of the HS code in India versus Bangladesh, leading to interpretation of duty structures, harmonization of the customs, which is a program that we've been working on as part of our program, are simple issues. These are non-tariff barriers. I think there's a political umbrella that's there, definitely. But there is a business aspect of it that I think can be facilitated and should be facilitated if this is going to happen systematically. So in terms of financing, what could we do to have some kind of a financing mechanism? The USAID uh, runs a very, very nice guarantee scheme, for example. What could be looked could there be a special mechanism of support services for South-South replication? Karma, what's your thinking as you, as you, as you roll out uh, SDF? Uh, I, 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 I uh, recognize the problem, but uh, for me, the challenge is even greater once you go to investment, because that's where we count. Uh, in today's, I just give an example, in today's social program, we have some projects based in, uh, say, Bhutan, India, and elsewhere. And some inputs come from some other countries. And the trucks are kept in the border for 20 days unless you do something with it. So these are uh, issues that, uh, all we, you know, I keep on saying that we have the blessings and support of eight governments. But uh, apparently governments are not necessarily on the ground as, as much as we would uh, see them because on the ground we have these customs issues and so on and so forth. So it is a, a huge challenge for us uh, taking this forward. And uh, the, the other challenges uh, I, I foresee is when you, uh, for us, it's, it's just a mindset. I don't know, the rules are clear, everything is fine, but it's a mindset. And uh, if, I, I, one of the solutions I feel is taking the entrepreneurs, say we have an entrepreneur from Bangladesh and India and Pakistan together. I think they'll somehow find a way to work out because the fund at our level will work with the governments and systems, but we cannot go down to the ground level. And therefore, this is unique about it that if you did as, as a private entrepreneur open an LC, which I'm familiar with in my former life, I was a central banker, and there were a lot of problems between Bhutan and Bangladesh. Uh, some, uh, some very unusual things happened in the uh, LCs, and I had to go there and resolve some issues. But that was within private sector and private sector. This one, I, I hope that because it has the eight states behind it, we will engage, we have all counterpart agencies in every country. The Ministry of fin Finance is our counterpart agency. As in when we run into issues, we request them to resolve for us and they try and help us. So for us, in terms of technical details, we hope that we will have a less rough, rough ride compared to a private investment. And therefore, for any social investor, or for the matter, any investor who would like to invest, uh, it will be less 
painful for you if you went through uh, SDA because we, we will rely on the uh, formal system to help us because now we have four years of experience that uh, it's been extremely difficult for us to work through. But uh, I am, uh, I've already alerted my board and I'm taking to the uh, higher, the next our structure is the eight finance ministers where uh, I'm submitting that this three country criteria is very complicated. It was well thought through, it was a good intention, but it's not going anywhere. So we also, I've, I've, uh, I've alerted the uh, senior management, senior officials of their respective governments that we need to rethink this, eight, this three country criteria. And unfortunately it is embedded in a charter and changing a charter requires the ratification of eight parliaments. So that's a long story for us, but we'll have to find ways to get around it. And I think if there's, where there are business people, where there's investment with money, I'm sure business people will find solutions to that. And we have eight governments to help this uh, process through. So I am largely depending on the uh, eight governments and ingenuity and the, and the cleverness of the business people with us working together to find solutions. And I have also in one of the big forums, I have also mentioned that one of the problems that we need to address is the legal and regulatory framework. SAC Development Fund has been given a juridical body in every country. So here in India, we can behave like an ICICI or a State Bank of India. But really, I don't know, because once we get down to the, the processes and enablers, we are not very sure. In Bangladesh, we can behave like any Bangladeshi bank, a basic bank or uh, a Dhaka bank. But I really don't know, because we're still doing that. So there are a lot of unknowns into this, and we need to work on all of that. But by the way, this is a four-year-old institution, trying to find solutions in as fast a uh, time as possible. But I think we're getting there, because now most people understand and accept SDF's role in this SAG region as one of the most real institution that can bring about, in a, it, maybe as humble as possible, a breakthrough in how we do businesses among ourselves. Thanks, Karma. I, I, I believe that you're in a very unique position. You can offer an array of products because you are owned by the ministers of finance. So you can do equity, debt, you can do many instruments, technical assistance, and you can be an excellent platform, like you mentioned, for financial institutions as well as for others who that want to be involved in this. And if I can add, the three sectors for social enterprise development uh, that you identified, health, renewable energy, agribusiness, and livelihood, are of interest to almost all the development agencies. Um, and, and for the bank, and for IFC, and, and perhaps for even for, for, for aid, one is to look at the larger uh, energy solutions at a larger level. Hydro is, is a big one that we've all been working together in Nepal. But then could there be other smaller social enterprise solutions that we can also nurture and, and replicate uh, across uh, across this region and also from here uh, in, in, into Africa? Could there be some kind of an action platform uh, for South-South replication and learning? The first thing was to really get a database going. And my the, the team here has been looking at putting a compendium of social enterprises. Uh, they, we've done one for the health sector in India, but they're doing one now for a global compendium of social enterprises that we can look at in terms of partnerships and ideas. And, and the team is doing that, which will be out for the public domain. So increasing the knowledge base is one, uh, but they include maybe an action platform for common services, including, I think, a financial instrument for South-South replication would be useful. The Exim Bank of India does that, but that's more focused from Indian companies going across. Could there be something at, at, a, at, a, at a higher level? What do you think? I, I think it's, sorry. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, I, I, would, I, would, I guess I'd make two comments on that. One is that I, I think in order to get the governments energized around these types of concepts, they have to be tied to some um, broader or perhaps larger foreign policy interest, Fair. right? And, you know, for example, one of, the, one of the areas where we've had a lot of resonance is in um, empowering Afghan women. It's a foreign policy priority of the United States. It's of great interest to the government of India, obviously. I think it's the fifth largest donor, actually, to Afghanistan. Many people may not know that. Um, and so we do work in areas like supporting organizations like SEVA, which is a self-employed women's association that looks at supporting empowerment, economic security for women through women entrepreneurs. And so, you know, we, we've been working uh, in India with SEVA, but we've also been working in Afghanistan uh, with SEVA and how 
we can use uh, successful women entrepreneurs to share their experience and examples um, to, to share with Afghan women entrepreneurs. And actually, I think it's been so successful to have a second phase of this partnership that both the governments of India and Afghanistan want to, want to support. So that's, that's you know, the first area is you want to be able to find alignment. The second one is this is a new area for us too, Anil. You know, this is not something that we are necessarily experts in. Um, and so while we're trying and we're failing and we're learning from our failures and we're trying to move on, um, it's important for us to try to be grounded as well. And that's where actually the social entrepreneurs come in in a way perhaps that they even don't realize, which is they need to teach us. Uh, they need to be able to, to reach back to us and say, this is what is working for us. This is where we might need support. These are the gaps or the challenges that the larger donor community might, might be able to help fill, but whether it's you know, building a better ecosystem or doing the type of policy interventions that are necessary. And so we as donors have to be receptive to that kind of, uh, that kind of feedback. We have to be open to hearing from, uh, directly from social entrepreneurs. I imagine that's why all of us here on this stage are actually here at Suncolp, is because this is an opportunity for us to hear directly from that community that we traditionally have not had as much engagement with. Fair enough, thank you. Kanu? Just a quick comment, uh, two comments. One on the reason why we chose three sectors, uh, sectors that you mentioned. When we started, we had a whole list of two pages of uh, programs that we would, uh, every country would want to have. We go through the uh, World Bank's country strategy paper, we go through the ADBs, and look at all the priorities, and they run into two, three pages. But later we came down on a practical level, and more immediate level, we felt that agribusiness livelihood was important, and something that we can do it in, in terms of business, uh, in terms of renewable energy, there's a lot of discussion on that, and uh, the uh, health, extremely important. So one reason why we chose is more from a practical point of view, and more solution-oriented point of view, more business-able business, business able, uh, point of view. So that's one reason. The other one, I think Mr. Anand mentioned about uh, uh, the work in Afghanistan. We have a similar program, a wonderful program that is in all the seven countries. And in Afghanistan, we have put up a place. We have trained more than 500 women. Now they are almost self-sufficient. We have women from Kunduz, Mazari, Sharif, Hirat, all coming to Kabul. They're being trained. They're being brought to India. And uh, Afghanist, Afghan women, Indian women, Buddhist women, uh, I don't know, Sri Lankan women, they, they spend uh, you know, maybe 15 days or 16 days together trying to understand the social context from which they are coming. So this has been, you know, we, I did not mention this because we have a lot of very important programs. One of this is livelihood for women. We, not general women, not entrepreneurs, but we're talking about home-based workers of South Asia, where we have, for instance, in my own country, uh, in, in the capital is Timpu. We have the same program in Bhutan. We had women who had never seen Timpu suddenly being brought to a bus to Timpu, train them on financial management, and talk to people marketing. And this is something that uh, this little project has become so powerful. In one particular country, i give an example. Uh, they, they scouted, scoped, and went to a village and uh, found you know, through their own women's association, uh, self-help group, and so and so, Sangi, or whatever, some, some other groups. And uh, they found one particular lady who seemed very enterprising, but she had to stay within certain cultural norms. But uh, our uh, staff, our colleagues went there and then talked to the community, talked to the husband, and convinced them to let her go and be trained in our program. She has been trained in our program, now she's an entrepreneur, and the husband works for her. She's engaging more people, so that is as, as humble, as powerful as it is, this program that we have. We are also in the post-harvest management. We are also in the avoiding violence against children. We are also doing uh, the community information at the last mile, very, very last mile. Bangladesh, wonderful program we are doing that. And it's in all the seven, in all the seven countries. In India, we are doing water, which, wash, which is water, sanitation, and hygiene. And they are uh, they're picking up. We are doing bamboo. We are going to do bamboo as, as an enterprise. We are going to do handicrafts as an enterprise. So, it's one of, except they had been done on a different model. We have had that experience for four years now. We want to move on the more social enterprise model, which is a little more different from grant mode that we're doing. And then we're actually looking to partner with as many uh, entrepreneurs in South Asia as possible so that you have the knowledge and we have the money and governments have the government. I don't know what more can we ask for it, isn't it? So 
I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible so that you write to us. We move this project forward so that we somehow, and I think uh, between the World Bank and us, we have agreed that every year we will fund 10 social enterprises in, all, in every country. That may be too ambitious, but we're aiming for that. And hopefully by 2016, we would have been able to fund 10 enterprises each in every South member country. Of that, we hope that a sizable portion will be cross-border enterprises, not unique to a particular country. Thank you, Kalman. Um, as as Man Pete mentioned, we're here to learn. Uh, we have an August gathering. And I'd like to really go back to the audience now for either questions or comments or suggestions. As development institutions, um, we're always looking to play that catalytic role. Suvadeep mentioned something that we did to assist him. As you know, I set up the IFC advisory business and we helped them uh, get certified. Setting standards, if you want to replicate a model, how does one country know that this model has a certain quality assurance? And Suvadeep mentioned the fact that it was certified and had the global certification and setting standards of what we did, it helped them go across. Could we be looking at other instruments like this? Agribusiness is a good example. We started to work to set up an agribusiness standard in India, uh, just an anecdote. Uh, the international standard for agribusiness is the GAP, Good Agricultural Practices. No medium-sized agribusiness industry in India could certify. It was a, too much of an ask. We worked with the local industry to set up a local standard it became known as the India Gap. It's now been adopted by the ministry. It's now accepted by the International Gap Certifying Agency as the entry standard for developing countries. If an agribusiness entity is got that India Gap or equivalent, at least we know when it goes to Africa, it has met certain standards and how do you treat your uh, small farmers, how do you look at um, environment issues, because we also have to be responsible that we're replicating something that has got a certain standard and a certain value. What else could we do in this space? Any suggestions? I'd like to go uh, to, to, to the audience. We have somebody from the UNDP. Maybe you can talk about what UNDP is doing. And uh, I'd love to hear from, uh, from Mr. Harpal and other people here. And, and we, have, we have Amit here from the uh, uh, India Impact Investors. And so, the, so I think, Amit, you have your hand first? Sure, sure. Yeah. In the region, you know, how much of what you're doing is equity or debt or grant? And second, if you can also talk a little bit about, especially for all the social entrepreneurs, how much of it is direct with social entrepreneurs and how much through other vehicles or funds? So if those two cuts you can offer, that'll be wonderful because Impact investing anyway is a, a little bit of a puzzle, and impact investing with DFIs is a different level of complexity. So it'll be wonderful if you can enlighten us. Sure. We, we can take a couple of questions, and then we can come back. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jitendra Sina. I'm South South Cooperation Specialist for UNDP Asia Pacific region. Uh, recently, I developed a framework and a strategy for government of law PDR. And now I'm developing a strategy for Bangladesh government. And uh, thank you, Mr. Sina, for raising the issue of uh, customs and other duty. I will take into consideration when I develop the strategy. I just uh, wanted to uh, share a couple of things with you. Like Mr. Manpreet Anand was telling about triangular cooperation. Uh, the difference between South-South cooperation and triangular cooperation is South-South cooperation, only partners from Global South are involved. And there is a danger of biasness, because one country who is providing the technology and resources has upper hand. So uh, as a UNDP expert, what uh, I have been provocating or putting in the framework uh, to initially start with triangular cooperation where a multilateral agency like UNDP or World Bank or say European Union or USAID, they work as a balance. They bring their expertise, well, not only expertise, but they work as a balance between the two global south countries. 
regarding the investment and finance, there are many, many resources. Uh, recently, you might have heard AIB has come. Uh, investment uh, infrastructure investment bank for Asia with $1 billion. Uh, ADB has its own wing for and fund for South South Corporation. UN has its own fund for South South Corporation. So resources are available. Exim Bank you have already given. Uh, Exim Bank have uh, LOC line of credit. And uh, as a social enterprise, you can get line of credit, say, in 1% to 2% only, annually compared to your commercial rate. So that's for Mr. Das. Uh, what we are doing with the government, because I'm bringing the government perspective, as uh, you are showcasing your model from the government side, we are looking for such models. And like uh, I see World Bank is preparing a kind of depository. Uh, we are also advocating the government to uh, look into such depository and identify the successful cases, which the government can take up. Uh, the framework and strategy for law PDR is getting finalized this month. So I can share with you what uh, we have done. Bangladesh, I have just kicked, uh, kicked it to start. Uh, 9th of May, uh, I have a stakeholder consultation workshop at Dhaka. So I'm, I, I will be inviting all of you to that. Thanks. So, um, what financial instruments? We'll come back to the next set of questions, but the, I think, please. Uh, can I use this one? Yes. I'm Swamini Adichananda. I'm the program director of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance. Um, soon we'll be launching women's based social enterprises to teach women to become wash entrepreneurs, uh, scalable enterprise with uh, the. Um, a model of franchises of good is what we call it. But my question is on agribusiness, actually, and water sustainability. Um, according to World Bank data, uh, for example, the state of Haryana extracts eight cubic kilometers of water every year. Um, I'm sorry, nine cubic kilometers, but they have eight cubic kilometers actually available. And most of the Yamuna, about 90% of it is being used in the ag se sector. Soon there'll be no water left. Um, according to the Diplomat magazine, we're expecting 115 million people to be in water crisis in this region very soon. So the question is, while the agra agrarian model looks very good in India right now, it uh, is set to decline quickly and in places like the Sahel also, according to IPIG and World Bank, we're gonna see some problems. So what is the next generation? You were talking, um, Mr. Anand, about the evergreen revolution. What are we going to do to make agriculture sustainable so we keep the water in the ground and in the rivers and we're able to actually have a next generation of agriculture that's sustainable? Thank you. I think there are a couple of more hands, but both these questions are very deep questions. Um, so uh, one more uh, specific to financial instruments and the other one to uh, the, ag the water crisis. Uh, but very nice to know that there is this gender-based entrepreneurship program for social enterprises and specific enough to wash. I think that's an excellent initiative and I think uh, yesterday we had a session on, on wash as you know and, and the bank is looking very seriously at, at supporting uh, the Swatch Bharat uh, but, um, a program, but, but for me the water crisis clearly is, 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 is a looming crisis, perhaps even more severe than the energy crisis in India. So um, a, a big question and uh, let's see what people have to say and offer and I'm sure there's no perfect answer we will give you and I'm sure you know more of the answers than we do, but we can give you our perspectives certainly. So, I'm pretty. Go first. Yeah. <clears throat> so, it seems like half the room is now lit up. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on there, but. Um, so, so well, the first question on debt and equity position, we don't actually take debt or equity positions. We're not investors in that sense. Um, what we do do is facilitate capital flows to social entrepreneurs, right? And so we have things like credit guarantee. 
mechanisms that can help reduce the, the risk and the cost of capital to facilitate um, uh, uh, loans to, to small, medium-sized enterprises who are working in these development sectors uh, because otherwise they may not have access to capital in a, in a way that, that they would be able to, um, to utilize. We also facilitate equity, but in a much more, uh, I, I would say, creating the right enabling environment, right, that uh, allows for, for equity flows. And, and that is that goes beyond just as, as USAID, right, even as a, as a whole of government exercise, we're always trying to promote uh, more trade and investment flows uh, to the develop, developing country, and that involves policy uh, uh, as well. So, so we look at it not so much from the micro sense and, and how we create the enabling environment. Um, and in terms of uh, whether we, we provide direct support to social, social entrepreneurs or not, yes and no. Um, it really depends on the opportunity. And we have a variety of mechanisms that I will not bore any of you with right now uh, to be able to do that. Some of our, uh, some of our grants uh, are relatively direct uh, straight to businesses. Some are, uh, again, going to organizations who have um, better reach and better uh, connections with the social entrepreneurial community that we could ever hope to have. And so we look, again, on the right types of partner mix to facilitate that. Um, in terms of the question on, um, on uh, water scarcity and, and how that uh, affects agricultural production and, and the sustainability of it, these are huge issues. They're huge issues, um, and they're local issues. Uh, and they tend to be local issues that then get magnified into you know different water basins that you're looking at, um, and so you know as a as an agency, um, this for us uh, is a lot looked into um, issues not just of just water management but also issues of climate and climate change and um, how we focus on sustainable landscapes, frankly. Um, and that can mean anything from what we're doing here in India, really focusing on the forestry sector when it comes to sustainable landscapes, or to what we're doing in Nepal, which is really focusing on, the, on, on better water basin management, um, given the, the huge potential of hydro resources that we think there's, there is huge potential of those actually being capitalized upon. But what are the environmental and social impacts of that, and how do you create a, how do you implement you know, a water basin resource management program that actually addresses some of those issues. So we, we tend to look at them in a more holistic way uh, to the extent that we can, um, figuring out what are, you know, what are the implications on not just agricultural productivity and food, but th the implications stemming from energy production and looking at that whole water energy food nexus. Um, so the, I hope that addresses your question. Uh, I'll, I'll address the financing part of it. I think there are two issues to it. One is instruments themselves, and second is how you deliver them. With the, so far, the SDA has been uh, making uh, disbursements directly to the enterprises themselves. But because we are owned by the aid governments, and every government has this uh, aid flow process, the money goes to the government, government goes to somewhere else, it's a bit tedious. And we are trying to, we are trying to avoid that by doing entrepreneurship so that we can now go straight uh, to the from fund to the, uh, the beneficiary or the recipient. But for a larger program that I mentioned just now, on the, say, home-based workers program, we have about $20 million on the ground in, in the seven countries. And every dollar has to go through a certain route. You know, and it sometimes it's a bit longish. We have to uh, put a lot of uh, lead time. But that is what it is, uh, because we are uh, what we are. But with regard to uh, social entrepreneurship, because it doesn't own by, it's not owned by the government, we believe that we can be able to make uh, payment directly, you know, disperse directly to the entrepreneurs. With regard to the instrument, uh, our charter defines three instruments, which is loans, grants, loans, credit line, and guarantees. This is mostly for the investment window, which we haven't discussed now, and it's not relevant for our discussion, but that's more for that. But with regard to the uh, social uh, enterprise development, the disbursements will be made directly by the SDF to the entrepreneurs, number one, and where, where there are issues, for instance, we are talking about one particular uh, fund investor who may want us to come with our grant part of it so that overall the uh, project becomes more viable, then the disbursement may, be, may end at the fund manager, and then that fund manager disperses on the project-wise. This is something we are looking at. And by the way, we're still at a design stage, fairly advanced design stage, and any, uh, any advice you 
will be able to you give us today will be factored into this uh, uh, design. Thanks. To the first question, Amit, there's the World Bank group. So there's the World Bank, which lends to the governments, and which includes uh, lines of credit. Um, but I think your question is more regarding IFC and the private sector lending arm of the World Bank. Um, so globally, portfolio about $25 billion a year. In India, about a billion dollars a year in lending. Um, portfolio divided roughly one-third financial markets, one-third infrastructure, one-third others. And that's roughly what you will see globally too. Instrument used, uh, debt and equity, we do guarantees, but I would say debt and e equity mainly. Coming from the Impact Investors Council, let me just segregate that portfolio into what we call inclusive business, which is the equivalent to of, of impact investing. Inclusive business for IFC is a business that has the majority of its impact on the BOP in a particular country. We use majority, not super majority, like we agreed in the Impact Investors Council. I'm open to deliberations. So we look at those companies and about a portfolio of about $9 billion. Interestingly, we did a portfolio comparison in terms of financial returns that we got from the inclusive business portfolio versus our main portfolio. It matched. So you, it matched. You can make money and do good development. It isn't anymore a separate thing. Um, and, and that's given us impetus to do more, more and more in this space, and we can do more in that space. Um, I, I think we can fine tune those products further, I think, and we can continue to do so. Um, but I think this question also fits into what, what, what you asked. Um, so the private sector really started some years ago uh, with our environment and social safeguards, which are very strong. Perhaps we are criticized for having too strong safeguard, but the whole idea was do no harm. From do no harm to do good. I think that's the continuum that the private sector is going through, and that's where IEC comes in, that's why IFC comes in, and the bank group comes in. Doing good, first stage was through CSR. Excellent. The next stage is doing good through your intrinsic business model, where it isn't something that you're doing on the side. And that's what's called shared value creation, and that's what you see these concepts coming through. I'm certified shared value creation consultant, et cetera, et cetera, Michael Porter's concepts. But the whole idea is how to do good now. So looking at water, the first thing was environment, social gu gu guidelines, uh, water audits. Every time you invest, you do a, first it was an energy audit. Now the energy audit includes a water audit, so you're not doing any harm. How much are you displacing? How are you putting in? The next steps was to look at companies that were actually doing good. Chain irrigations, drip irrigation is a good example. Uh, we, we financed them four times now. And where we were, they became the leaders in this. And looking at many other viola, many other water conservationist kind of uh, private sector companies, that was our other con contribution. The problem is too large for me to say that we can do this alone. We can't do this alone. The private sector cannot do this alone. I'm sorry to say it's not a market solution water conservation. And I think there we need to look at much with the civil society, behavior change, everything we spoke about uh, in water and sanitation applies to water much more specifically, and of course, the government. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have a perfect solution for you. I don't think I know that solution as yet, but it has to be through this partnership approach with the private sector playing its responsible part and going to do good, not just avoiding harm. Any other questions? Yes, please. I'm Chris from ESAF. I'm really I'm very happy and uh, appreciate World Bank, IFC, and IntelCAP for bringing out a lot of uh, awareness and uh, encouraging the real social entrepreneurs to expand their borders to the Africa and other needy areas. And we are seriously concerned about on livelihood and uh, energy and uh, farmer cooperatives. But I, I suffer from a lack of clarity. Where can I have the next catch to, to climb up? Where is my first step? What shall I do to go ahead?
uh, if I understood you correctly, for, for SDF, make a project proposal. Make a project proposal that contains three countries, okay. somehow or the other, and that's the start and end of it. So without a project proposal, we are a fund. <laughs> and if the project proposal comes to our, uh, our table, we'll look at it, try and see how best we can improve it and improve the design. And of course, we start with any, like any other investment, we start with logical framework, logicking the whole process from the concept to the finish, and uh, apply our own normal things like scalability, replicability, sustainability, all stuff. Once you have that on the table, you have started your work. Thank you, thank you. So what could be the Africa, what IFC and World Bank and Intel Cap will do that? We look forward to Mr. Karma's appraisal, and uh, <laughs> he will share it with us. <laughs> <laughs> but sure, look, we encourage it because I think this is a unique platform. If you're a South Asian entrepreneur, this is a unique platform. It's an easy entry platform. Um, it, yeah, please. Just one quick comment. Maybe this is not addressing your question in a slightly oblique way. But in addition to all the processes, which we could go to some length and tell you, you know, for our agency, this is the steps you go through. For us, and I think it's a common theme you've heard throughout the session, partnership is key, right? And so find the right partners that you think are gonna help you along this journey, and then come talk to us. Or come talk to us and say, we're looking for these kinds of partners. Wh who, who would you suggest? Because we all recognize that this takes a multifaceted approach. And so if you're looking about, well, how should I start? One of the first questions we ask ourselves is, who are we gonna partner with? And if we don't come up with a good answer to that, then we really question why we're doing it in the first place. There's a question here from Sugand. I don't know which organization she belongs to. <laughs> I'm Sugan from DFID. Um, I have a quick question for Mr. Karma, and this is just specific to the social enterprise development fund that you talked about. <coughs> is there a certain direction of the cross border that you're interested in? I mean, does it have to be Bangladesh to India, or does it have to be India to Bangladesh? I'm just off the head taking an example. Um, is there a particular stage of enterprises that you're looking at? Uh, with regard to stage, we're looking at uh, early stage, uh, scaling up. Uh, maybe two years or more experience, somebody who has understood, the, uh, found his or her feet on the ground and wants to scale it up, needs more help. So uh, because we are not at uh, incubation, maybe at some point we should even think of that. But phase one, we want to start with what is more doable so that we build uh, our own experience reputation. With regard to the direction, it's open because we're supposed to be equidistant from every country. So we can't, if, as a CEO, I can't say, okay, we do India, Bhutan, because I'm from Bhutan, no. We are equidistant, depends on the proposal. Which pro whichever proposal has better, f I don't know, better legs or stronger legs, we, we run with that. Otherwise, we, uh, there's no such policy issue. Okay, Hi. Last uh, question, if that's okay. Uh, my name is Vivek. I uh, work for a technology company called Avasde. Uh, I would request Mr. Das to share how did he uh, get access to funds and access to markets. Uh, probably, uh, since you have done it already, if you share your experiences, it would be better for uh, people like us who, who are in the process. We, we went the classical startup route. Uh, so, uh, so these three entrepreneurs who started the company uh, got money from their college professor as, uh, yeah, as, I mean, as the starting capital. Uh, but what, uh, what the company has focused on is a sustainable model where you generate enough cash flows over a period of time. So, um, so for instance, we don't uh, we don't sell on credit uh, to anybody. So right down the chain, right up to the village level entrepreneur, about seven thousand of us who work with us, they buy from us and so on. Uh, so to answer your question, I mean, we uh, then we raised the Series A funding from a couple of uh, social impact investors, and what we did was um, we also found interesting ways of managing working capital. As an, as an example, we work with an organization in India uh, who's a logistics organization, uh, but they buy uh, the goods from us and then they sell it on to the stock points. So at, any, at no point in time, we, uh, we have any inventory carrying costs. Right? So again, that was, that was an innovative model we thought of uh, because we, we definitely, uh, the stage of 
company we were, let's say two years back, we couldn't afford to. So we wanted to sell uh, a million lights every year, but we definitely couldn't afford the inventory of a million lights uh, or at, at even half of that. Uh, I mean, we recently raised our Series B about two months back. Uh, so yeah, so we've gone the classical way, but the only differences we've made is that we've tried to be clever about managing our funds and um, and managing our working capital. We had one question from uh, Mr. Andrew Smith, who's representing Lord Sainsbury Foundation, uh, Ms. Singhi. Is there a mic? Is there a question to be asked? Um, well, I have a question, um, if I may ask, because it mentioned before it's the last question, but I, I thought Mr. Anand mentioned a very important point that that was uh, establishing a channel of communication um, between entrepreneurs and the uh, programs that they fund. Um, because I noticed, uh, well actually to introduce beforehand, um, I work for the uh, Business Innovation Hub. This is a branch of the American University of Afghanistan that works with um, businesses and entrepreneurs. And we noticed that some of those entrepreneurs, they don't go for this possibility of uh, getting fund or investment because there are certain issues on the way. And we definitely felt the need to, that there should be a sort of uh, channel of communication between investors and the entrepreneurs who need the investment. Uh, can you please elaborate more if there's any channel already established to facilitate this, or if there's any plan in the future to have that happen so that uh, those entrepreneurs on the ground can tell you how effectively your investment can work on the ground for them. Please elaborate more on that. Um, both, um, on the side of uh, SARC Development Fund and USAID programs, that would be great. Thank you. So I, I, I know we're running out of time, so I'll be very quick. Um, and I don't have a great answer for you, unfortunately. Uh, I, we were, I participated in a breakfast just this morning uh, between investors and entrepreneurs that circled around this exact issue. Is there a forum by which entrepreneurs and investors can learn from each other, learn how to, to, to streamline the process. Um, and there were a few ideas put out there, but there doesn't seem to be you know, one single point of contact necessarily or one forum. Uh, there are ideas like this, this new India Impact Investment Council that's being stood up and that might be a good entry point. I guess my overall uh, response to you is, I think that's exactly why you have gatherings like this, right? That you have, you know, Sunculp, you have other forums around the world so that you can try to make those connections. To the extent that donor agencies can be helpful in providing an enabling environment, we're absolutely looking at that. I mean, that's part of the reason that why we're here. Um, but we d I don't have a great answer for you just now. Ask me again in a year. Hopefully we would have solved it. Fair enough. Um, the organizers are giving me the two hands up there and Mr. <laughs> Andrew had his hand up there. So I'll just take Andrew's question. We'll talk off, offline. Just behind you, please. And then we'll have to close because they need to turn this room around. Please, Thanks. Andrew. Sorry, sorry for keeping us going. Um, so my name is Andrew Smith. I'm a program director at the uh, Gatsby Foundation, which, as Anil mentioned, is the private foundation of um, a, a business person in the UK, Lord David Sainsbury. Um, so we're, we're in the process of setting up, a, uh, with our partners, a new technology transfer institution um, for East Africa, uh, initial funding of 50 million US dollars over the first five years, helping um, high growth potential businesses in East Africa uh, transfer technology to the region. I guess my question to, um, particularly to Karma, uh, Manpreet and, uh, and Alil, um, we're in this process with our partners, um, you, you're doing this already, what would be your top learning um, for us as we set up this new tech transfer initiative in East Africa, your number one learning um, we should keep front of mind. Um, and maybe perhaps not, um, I already heard from Karma, um, not making sure the parliaments have to change, uh, uh, <laughs> go to parliament to change assessment criteria, but other top learnings maybe. You know, I think all three of us would say one word. Just one word. Partnership. Partnership. Don't reinvent. Partner, expand, leverage. That's in one word. And we're there to support you as partners in any way we can. 
great initiative. Wish you all the best. Two partnerships.